Good afternoon, councillors, and welcome back to the afternoon session. Before I begin, I'd like to apologise to, to Grant Ling because I shut him down while he was maybe making a, val a very valid point. So I apologise to councillor Ling and I hope he will accept my apology. Um, that, if I could comment, we promise thank you very much for, for the apology. And it, I, I'm, I wasn't really looking for apology per se because I know it's a very difficult job you're doing. But um, I, I felt it was, uh, I wasn't going to comment, but I had to contradict the previous comment which you allowed. So thank you for the apology and I accept it uh, totally and uh, uh, I just won't accept it. And it's gone now. So thank you for that. OK. Thank you very much, Councillor Lane. We will now turn to paper 10, the Governance Review and Member Officer Working Group. So can I now invite Lisa Simpson, Head of Legal and Governance, to introduce this report. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillors, we've today on the agenda discussed the development of the Perth and Kinross offer, which represents a new way of working with our communities and with the public, private and third sector partners to design and deliver sustainable public services for the future. If we are to be successful in that ambition, then we need to have a governance framework that will support that. Our governance framework um, encompasses everything from our culture, our values as an organisation, to our systems, policies, processes and controls. It's often wrongly perceived as a barrier to progress and innovation, but an effective governance framework is in fact an enabler for any organisation to achieve its aims. As we progress with the offer, therefore, it's important that we review our existence governance framework to ensure that it is fit for purpose. It is proposed that we use the SIPFA governance mark of excellence accreditation process to support a holistic review. I am currently in the process of ascertaining the cost of the accreditation process from SIPFA, but I do believe that being able to, pro to use this process to structure the review will save time resources in the long term over the piece. The report sets out the proposed scope and the remit of the governance review. Given how integral effective political decision making, scrutiny, oversight and accountability is, however, to good governance, it is important that members and officers work together not only to shape and to help deliver the offer, but to ensure that our governance arrangements can help us to achieve those ambitions. Accordingly, it is proposed to establish two member officer working groups, one overseeing the development of the offer and the second reporting into that group overseeing the review of the Council's governance framework. Recent discussions within the current offer MOG comprising five members brought forward four alternative permutations for membership. I had hoped to present options, but when thinking how this could be managed in the Chamber today, this proved impractical. I have therefore taken a very pragmatic approach and provided the option which will form the administration motion against which any elected member can put forward an alternative proposal by way of an amendment. And unless prescribed by legislation, I as the monitoring officer have no view on the membership or representation on any committee, board or group. This is entirely a matter for council and for you as elected members to determine. The recommendation therefore is not indicative of an officer preference in any way, shape or form. The scheme of delegation provides that we try to adhere to the principles of political balance. Officers were asked to give an illustration as to the numbers to assist members in their consideration, and this is attached at Appendix 1 of the report. I'm happy to take any questions. Deputy Provost. Thank you very much. Lisa, invite questions from members, please. I don't see any questions coming up in the chat box, but that might just be a delay. Deputy Provost, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. From Councillor Bailey. Has a question. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, my question is um, regarding the recommendation. So given what um, Mrs. Simpson just said, it may be a question for the administration more than actually officers. Um, what is the background to the modernising governance MOG being proposed to be, sorry, what's the, the reason for the governance MOG being proposed to be only seven members 
while the offer would be a nine member MOG. What's the reason that we're proposing different numbers for each of those MOGs? Thank you. I'm happy to address that. I think it, yes, in the first instance, it was suggested that the um, modernising governance MOG be replaced and the governance MOG become a subgroup of the um, overarching offer MOG. And so therefore, you know, ordinarily a subgroup, you would tend to have a smaller membership than the overarching group. It's simply a suggestion. And as I said, uh, Councillor Bailey, Bailey, it in no way indicates any per personal preference. It simply was giving a proposal around which elected members can consider and perhaps suggest alternatives, but simply the fact that a subgroup tends to be smaller. OK, a follow up, if I may, please, Deputy Provost. Yes, please. Um, I know that most of us in this chamber will be already aware of it, but just for the record and since we're in public session, could someone confirm my understanding that these MOGs are non-voting bodies and um, and that they don't reach any decisions? They they help officers to form recommendations, which are then brought to full council. Is my understanding correct, or the appropriate committee? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, my chat box has gone again. I do not see any chats. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Stewart. Um, Thank you, Deputy Provost. It was a question, um, I think, for the Head of Legal and Governance Services. Um, I think you indicated in your introduction that you were looking to establish the costs of the, um, uh, sit, the, the sit for mark for the framework for good governance. I, I may be wrong, but I think in one of the recent recovery and renewal uh, or Perth and Ross offer MOG meetings, we had an indicative cost of somewhere around five to seven thousand pounds for that. Um, certification process? That was based on the literature. The um, position as regards the cost, which I've subsequently discovered, is that, that it, it will depend on the size of the organisation and the complexity of the task, which is why I have um, been in communication with SIPFA and I'm trying to ascertain a cost. Um, clearly, we've never done this before, so I don't have an indication of, of what that might be for a local authority our size. OK, thank you. Councillor Parrott, uh, uh, Deputy Provost. Mr Parrott. Thank you very much, Provost and Deputy Provost. Um, I, I, I listened with interest to what Lisa Simpson said in terms of subordination of one MOG to, to another. Um, and, and, and it worries me slightly in the sense that, to me, Governance is an overarching activity across all of our actions, um, whereas the offer is, if you like, um, a, a, a part, but an important part of our actions. And, and, and I don't therefore understand how governance can be subordinated to the offer. And, I, and I'd be grateful for clarification there. Thank you. Um, I don't think I mean that it's it's subordinate to the offer. It's 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 clearly a a framework in its own right. By the offer, I am actually talking about the whole strategic direction and the aims and the outcomes of this organisation, which is what um, the governance framework is designed to um, support and develop. And it does that by virtue of um, the wide arching um, and, and overarching um, elements of good governance which range from leadership and culture and values right the way through to our systems, processes and controls. But our ultimate aim um, is the, the key outcomes, the defined outcomes that the Council needs to deliver. And I'm using the offer as a shorthand for that, but it's not a, a case that it's not important. It, the fact is the governance framework is designed to deliver that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, this question is for Lisa in relation to governance, because governance is within the scope um, of the scrutiny committee. So I'm just curious as to why a separate MOG has been set up or been proposed that sits outside of that, when perhaps it might be more appropriate to have that as a subcommittee of the scrutiny looking at governance. Um, I think I might beg to differ with you, Councillor McCall. Scrutiny is an element of good governance. Good governance is far broader than just the scrutiny function within the the council, so I I, I would, would disagree with that that assertion. But okay, scrutiny, well, scrutiny has an important role to play, 
um, uh, and is a key is a key element of good governance and where appropriate the papers that require scrutiny and that function to be carried out will be done through the scrutiny committee as is set out. I'm not quite sure I equate that you know I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today but I certainly would like to understand a bit more how you see these two things as being separate because I don't right now. I don't see um, them as being separate. I see scrutiny as being a fundamental element of good governance. I see the governance framework being a far wider um, function than simply the scrutiny function. I don't think they're actually saying something different. I just think that there's a different. I see scrutiny as an element of governance. I don't see governance as an element of scrutiny. No, I understand that part of it, Karen. I think my concern is that um, Scrutiny has a role to play in good governance, which I agree, um, but somehow you're doing something that's offline and doesn't involve scrutiny at all uh, through that process not as part of them. Or what you're suggesting is that, I, that scrutiny doesn't have a role to play in developing the new governance framework. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that okay. there is a member, there is a member officer, we're proposing a member officer working group which has no decision making powers and any powers that require the input of scrutiny and any consultation with the scrutiny committee will of course be adhered to. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeking, I'm not seeking to undermine the scrutiny function in any way. No, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking you were, Karen, I was trying to understand it, so yes. it was just really a purely academic question, but thank you for your explanation, and if I'm still confused, I'll come and speak to you separately. Thank you. Are there any more questions on this? I don't see any question coming up. I'll give it a second or two because things are a bit slower today. No, there are no questions. So in that case, I will invite Councillor Lyle to move the report. <coughs> Councillor Lyle. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. The Perth and Kinross offer presents a significant shift from traditional thinking in terms of public service design and delivery, with an emphasis on genuine collaboration and co-creation with our communities. We need to develop new ways of working, not only with our communities, but with our public, private and third sector, sector partners. <coughs> if we are to design and deliver <coughs> these public services, we need people now and in the future. Our governance framework, whilst robust and effective, has been designed to support the more traditional public service model of design and delivery. It is therefore needs re revision, refined and in some parts redesigned to make sure that it's fit for purpose if we are to be successful in achieving our ambitions. We are therefore proposing a holistic review of the governance framework using the SIPFA guidance mark of excellence accreditation process to help redesign it, to ensure that it's fit for purpose in supporting the council to shape and deliver the offer in future. Whilst parts of the governance framework deal with operational matters, which will be reviewed by the chief executive and senior management team, other aspects are fundamental to the role of elected members, setting the strategic direction, effective decision making, political leadership, accountability, scrutiny and oversight. I believe that it is important that members and officers work closely together, not only to help shape the offer, but to create the governance framework needed to turn the offer from a laudable concept to a positive reality for the people of Perth and Kinross. The current Perth and Kinross offer MOG comprises five members based on the membership of the previous elected member sounding board. The sounding board, however, was a short term measure put in place to support the organisation during the <coughs> operation of emergency powers in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am there propo therefore proposing that the membership be reviewed and extended to nine members reflecting the political balance within the wider chamber as illustrated in the appendix to the report. I am also proposing that the modernising governance MOG to be replaced by a new governance MOG comprising of seven members based again on the political balance within the wider chamber. I therefore move one that the Council agrees to use the SIPFA governance mark of excellence accreditation process to support the governance review. Two, approves the scope of the governance review as detailed in the report. Three, agrees that the modernising governance mob 
be disbanded and a new governance mob be established with seven members based on political balance. Four, approves the general scope of the Perth and Kinross offer mob as detailed in the report. And five, agrees that the membership of the offer mob should be nine members based on political balance. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Happy to move the paper. Thank you very much. Can I invite Councillor Duff to second the paper, please? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Happy just to formally second. Thank you very much. I now invite comments on the report. Councillor. Deputy Provost, there's an indication of an amendment from Councillor Zander McDade. Yes, I just noticed that just now. Thank you very much, Lisa. So, Councillor McDade, would you like to speak to your amendment, please? Um, yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I'm wondering if officers might be able to share the text of the amendment on the screen. I haven't got visual, so I'm not quite sure if it is actually being shown or not. But if yes, officers... it has been shown on the screen. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, it, just in line with my previous position on membership of member officer working groups, um, I'm proposing this amendment. Um, I wasn't quite sure what leader of the council was going to bring forward, but I did prepare an amendment in case um, it was required. So uh, the purpose, from my point of view, of member officer working groups is to achieve cross council support on the topic the group is considering. Um, and as they're non-voting bodies, it's important that we get voice from across the political spectrum to take into take part in those discussions and to feed into them. Um, and that requires all political groups on the council to be represented as part of that group. Um, so this amendment seeks to ensure that um, we achieve all political groups being represented on it, but also that it broadly maintains political balance uh, of the council as well. Thank you very much, Councillor McDade. And you've got a seconder for your amendment. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, that's um, correct. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, as confirmed earlier in the meeting, these aren't um, voting bodies, so I see no harm in having representation from across the chamber. Thank you. Happy to formally second. Thank you very much. I will now invite members to speak. I see no one wishing to speak at this moment. I'm sorry, I don't see anyone wishing to speak at this moment. Could I formally move the, the we, we move to the vote, Deputy Provost, please, in accordance with the current standing orders. I think it's section 54. Second deed if required, Provost. Okay, that's, that's that's the wish of the council. Linda, are you in charge of the voting today? Yes, councillors, we've we've received a motion by Councillor Wilson, seconded by was it Councillor Barrett? Yes. That the move to the vote. Can you indicate whether you're for or against this? And I call out your name. Councillor Hearn. Motion. There is only, sorry, it's just if you're for or against it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Councillor Anderson. Excuse me. I think De Deputy yes, Provost, please, can I, can I please uh, intervene? Um, sorry, sorry, Linda, uh, but given that there are no comments and that no one wishes to make any comment we simply now need to proceed to the vote which is councillor uh, mcdade and bailey's oh. amendment against the motion i, I realize that that by moving to to proceed to the vote but that that would only be something that would need to be considered by way of a vote if they were still in the process whereby right. comments were outstanding but on the basis that we have no comments we can simply now move to put the, the amendment against the vote 
Linda. Well, so if you could please take that forward, that would be appreciated. Apologies. So we have a, a motion from councillors Lyle and Duff that the report recommendations in report 20 of week 184 be accepted and an amendment by councillor is that not correct yes yes linda you have councillor yeah. you have your councillor murray and councillor duff's motion uh -huh. an amendment being proposed sorry i just thought someone was disagreeing with that apologies and the, amend the amendment is by councillors um, McDade and Councillor Bailey, the contents of which were displayed on the screen. If anyone wants that a clarification on that, they can let me know now or we could just go to the vote. I would just go to the vote, please, Linda. Right. Can you please indicate whether you're for the motion or the amendment? Councillor Ahern. Motion. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Bailey. Amendment. Councillor Baird. Motion. Councillor Barnacle, I don't think Councillor Barnacle's here. Councillor Barrett. Motion. Councillor Braun. Motion. Councillor Brock. Amendment. Councillor Audrey Coates. Motion. Councillor Donaldson. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Duff. Motion. Councillor Forbes. Motion. Councillor Gray. Amendment. Councillor Illingworth. Motion. Councillor James. Motion. Councillor Jarvis. Motion. Councillor Lane. Amendment. Councillor Lyle. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Councillor McCall. Amendment. Councillor McDade. Amendment. Councillor McEwen. Amendment. Provost Malloy. Provost Malloy. Motion. Thank you. Councillor Parrott. Amendment. Councillor Pover. Councillor Pover. Amendment. Councillor Purvis. Amendment. Councillor Rebeck. Amendment. Councillor Reid. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Sorry, Councillor Robertson's not here. Councillor Sarwar. Amendment. Councillor Shires. Motion. Councillor Simpson. Motion. <coughs> Councillor Stewart. Amendment. <coughs> Councillor Waters. Amendment. Councillor Williamson. Amendment. Councillor Wilson. Motion. Councillors, the uh, amendment is carried by 18 votes to 17. Thank you very much, councillors. I, I am unclear whether anybody speaks now or just move on to the next paper. OK. That matter is now dealt with. You can proceed to the, the next paper. Thank you very much. We will now move on to paper 11, the revised timetable of the meetings from October to December. Are we Do happy you, to... 
Deputy Provost, there appears to be a point, point of clarification from uh, Councillor Ahern. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not come up in my... No, I appreciate that, that, that your chat's out of sync. Councillor Ahern. Thank you. Um, bearing in mind these numbers are based on 38 councillors, is this going to be reviewed uh, once we're back up to the full uh, 40 after the local elections? Well, we've actually we, we've we've made a, an agreement. It's now not based on political balance. The amendment has put forward an alternative, which is not quite reflective of political balance, and that's now been agreed by council. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are we happy to agree the revised timetable as set out in the agenda? Agreed. Yeah, Question. Promised. Yes, you may. Um, oh, uh, sorry, I see that Councillor McCall has a question uh, um, and mine might be reflected. I think, I think what we're seeing on the screens were the questions from the last the last paper. I'm not, not sure if mine is out of sync. No, my question's on this paper. All oh, right, sorry. Right. Um, so given that my question was about to be uh, it was given was about to be about scrutiny committee i wonder if um it would be appropriate to let uh, the convener of scrutiny ask her question first in case i steal her thunder sorry deputy provost uh, my question is not about scrutiny so you probably oh. wouldn't have stolen my thunder oh. my question actually is about the timing of the common good committees um i did raise before a previous council meeting about the arbitrary nature of rescheduling and meetings that normally would be held on a Wednesday to uh, Thursday, I think, in terms of scrutiny before. And I'm just wondering what is the logic of having common goods uh, on a Tuesday and then on a Thursday without any consideration at all as to whether or not elected members can attend? I don't know if anyone can answer the question, but I just think there are not enough Wednesdays in a week to take all the meetings at the moment. That is probably a simple explanation because our days are, we're filling our days. We have had time to have a common good today and we don't know when we would have got started. So I think that's it's a time issue. There's only one Wednesday in a week, I'm afraid. I think my issue here, Kathleen, and I, this is the one I raised before, I accept that, there, that it's it's there is challenges around doing live broadcasts and multiple meetings on the same day. But the, the common agreement that we have is that most uh, activity and meetings for councillors are held on Wednesdays or Mondays or Wednesdays. And many councillors who have other commitments um, have planned their time accordingly. And therefore, I don't understand why, when the common good committees themselves are not particularly lengthy meetings, why these could not have been held, for example, on a Monday instead of Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I don't understand why that decision was made and what consultation was made with elected members to see whether or not you could even get a quorum to attend. I think this can this can be looked at. Thank you for thank you for raising it. Yeah. Can I commend Deputy Provost to think that you yes, sort of can look at those um, the dates for common good again in consultation with the members of the the common good committees. Thank you both. Thank you. So. Councillor Bailey, did you have a question on this paper? I can go back up to where I am showing. It was a comment. I'm happy to wait till the comment section or I can go ahead now. It's something very short. Well, this was just, it was just asked to agree. I wasn't expecting this to be a long debate paper. Just make your comment now then, please. Yeah, thank you. It's a very short procedural comment. Um, I wonder if it might be useful to highlight the changes when these things are brought to council in future, because um, myself and maybe some others have to go through diaries and um, see what the changes were that were actually being proposed. Maybe a different um, colour coding or asterisks could be used to highlight changes. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Good Happy point. to take that on board. Thanks. Councillor have... Stewart. Councillor Stewart. Oh, sorry. No, no uh, Deputy Provost, I was just going to try and assist you by way of giving, catching up the chat. I was going to say that Councillor Stewart has a question next. Yes, I do see that. <laughs> Councillor Stewart. OK, um, I'll, I'll come back in then, but I, I know that the, um, Councillor McDade and Councillor McCune also have questions before I got the queue in the chat. Um, my question about scrutiny committee was this. Um, at the last scrutiny committee meeting, it was determined that we would do a scrutiny review of um, 
the uh, call in judicial review um, decision. Um, and um, what there is not another scrutiny committee meeting <clears throat> in the calendar until December. And I was wondering whether it is possible to proceed with appointing the panel to, to do that um, uh, scrutiny review without um, having that approved at a full meeting of the scrutiny committee. Because we were about to, we were almost ready to um, start appointing that panel to take forward the scrutiny review, um, but it couldn't, it wasn't ready quite in time, just by about a week or so um, from the last meeting of the scrutiny committee. So can that continue and proceed um, in the interim before the December meeting, or does it need a full meeting of the scrutiny committee to agree the terms, um, uh, scope, terms of reference and membership? I'm happy to take that one. Or Lisa, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Colin, to answer your question, uh, the scrutiny committee, there will be a, a meeting held of the scrutiny committee um, outside of the normal committee cycle to do exactly what you've said, that okay. we will be agreeing the subcommittee to look at that and some other issues that arose as well, um, right. as well as uh, agreeing the terms of reference. We've just had quite a full calendar recently, and so sure. it's not been possible to fit that in until now, but look out for something coming through in your diary in the next week or so. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Parrott. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I'm grateful to Barbara Renton for clarifying that the timetable can be revisited. Um, it was a little bit of surprise that as convener of the Perth Common Good, I, I, I saw that the meeting um, was on a Tuesday as opposed to anything else. Um, that suits me perhaps, but it might not suit others. And I'm grateful that the matter can be readdressed. Thank you. Thank you. I Deputy Provost, we have Councillor McDade has a question. Sorry, my, my, my chat box is completely out of sync with everybody uh, else. Councillor McDade. Um, thank you, Deputy Provost. Challenging. Um, I would, um, I originally had a question which uh, has now been asked by others in terms of why common goods had been moved um, to Tuesdays and Thursdays. I now have a proposal which I'll raise when we get to the relevant point um, on the basis of what has been explained by officers. We have a question from Councillor Tom McEwen. Thank you very much. Uh, as convener of the Blake Airy Common Good, you know, had no involvement of the meetings being on a Tuesday and Thursday, which I would not attend, be able to attend due to my NHS work. We we're only three member wards, so I don't know whether that would make the committee competent. Also, at our last meeting of that Common Good, uh, we actually put the issuing of funds in abeyance. Uh, so I'm not even sure whether that common good needs to continue, but as we've had no conversations, I don't know even if that's valid or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions, uh, right. Deputy Provost. I just see comments and there is a comment. I, I don't know whether, do councillors have any other questions? No. So moving on to comments, I think Councillor Rebeck has a comment to make. Thanks very much, Lisa. I, um, I might be duplicating a little bit what's been previously said, but uh, just to underline Councillor Nicole's comments about the Tuesday, Thursday thing, I would have to underline that I'm happy to attend committees whenever the convener wants me to attend committees. It's a responsibility I take seriously, but my understanding from the last modern governance MAUG was that as far as possible, and it's not always possible, um, that council business should be on a Monday and a Wednesday. And I do understand that that gives us difficulties during COVID, but the kind of random Tuesday, Thursday thing was a little bit frustrating. So just to underline Councillor McCall's in that one. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McDade, do you have something you wish to add, a comment or a proposal? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Yes, um, I would like to formally move that we have in line with um, what was intimated by officers that we formally agree the scheduling of common goods will be agreed in consultation with the relevant members of those common goods based on the discussion we've just had where a lot of us are working on Tuesdays and Thursdays and it will not 
uh, suit us to have meetings on those days. Um, as others have mentioned, common goods generally have smaller numbers and it should hopefully be easier to reach agreement on uh, other times such as Mondays um, or perhaps end of day on Wednesdays after other committees uh, when those committees, those common goods could be held. So I would like to formally move that. Uh, I am ha I'm happy to, to go back and revisit the issue of the timing of common good committees. Uh, the, the, the driver has been resource implications, so we're happy to consult with each of the common good committee members around each of their committees and hopefully we'll be able to explain some of our resource issues as well and come to a position that's more mutually acceptable to all of us. So we will take that offline if there is no objection to that from any other members and we will revisit the issue of the timing of common good committees if that is the will of the chamber. Thank you all very much for your comments and I think we all realise that People are busy, councillors are busy, officers are extremely busy trying to fit everything in and it's almost impossible to please every councillor every time. I mean, I know this week I've had meetings Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. So, I mean, I think we have to realise we cannot possibly have everything in a Monday and Wednesday if we want to get through as much business and we keep adding more business and more work. So I think we need to be realistic and I agree that maybe some negotiation be done, done so that people can go when it's suitable but um, I'm sure officers will try do their best to please everyone and suit everyone's arrangements. Right if there are no further comments we accept the revised timetable a caveat of what has just been said the common good funds will be re-looked at. Okay thank you. Sorry Provost there's a, a, a comment from Councillor Lane. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Lane. Sorry. It's okay, um, uh, Deputy Provost. I know that there's a lot of stuff flying about for you, and it's a very hard thing. I can't. I'm struggling to keep up with it here, and you're trying to convene the meeting, so it must be exceptionally hard. So it's not a problem at all. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I would just like to say that as councillors, we we give up our Monday and our our, our Wednesdays. Uh, as we're expected to do, to give up two days a week. I think that's how we pro rata are paid uh, and senior councillors are, are paid pro rata to give up three out of five days, which which is fair. Um, I, I, I do think and um, that we also, all of all parties and all councillors, and we all take a job seriously, give up a lot of time in evenings, etc., which are not counted in. Um, so, to put common goods in on a Tuesday or a Thursday when we could fit them in maybe at nine o'clock or even half eight. I think uh, councillors, if we, if we put it out and ask them, would you rather come in at 8.30 on a Wednesday and do your common good before a full council or come in on a Thursday at 10 o'clock? Let them choose because it's they, they who are giving up their time. We've got, we've got councillors who we want to change the demographic of the the council of councillors. We want younger people, people who are working, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be involved. So all I'm asking is for the we ask councillors who we all come from diverse backgrounds and diverse uh, work ethics and we're obviously different ages. We we should be putting out to us when is the best that we can serve our public the best and our families. So. I'm saying it shouldn't be prescribed and put down, it should be done through discussion. That's all I'm saying, uh, Deputy Provost. Thank you. Thank you very much. But we need to remember that we have committee services that need to be there at meetings as well, and we're expecting them to be there at eight o'clock in the morning to be prepared for meetings. So I think we need to think of the whole thing holistically and try to please everybody. And I think these comments have been well made, and I'm sure the officers will work hard to try and come to some agreement to please everyone. So thank you for your comments. Thanks, David. Thank you. We now move to, uh, to item 12, polling places. I'm asked to ask members to agree the proposed temporary changes to polling places. And Agreed. I've also asked, thank you. And to the Hold on, I have a comment I'd like to make. COVID-19 on the by-election, the authority for changing to polling stations be delegated to the chief executive. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor McCall, I think you'd to comment. I think it was you. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. 
Um, the, uh, these both these polling places are in my ward, and at the last time we had a review of polling places, um, I did point out that parts of the ward were poorly served by the polling places that currently exist specifically uh, around about the Riggs Road area and that end of the Glasgow Road, uh, who, who the voters have to go all the way up to the Academy Scout Hall, where there's no easy public ac public transport access. So all I'm, ask, all I'm suggesting is that perhaps while we're looking at making appropriate provisions to ensure that voters can access and can actually get out to vote with, with some ease and mindful of whatever the, the social distancing guidance might be, that those who, that we should look again at those particular voter group that uh, are, are living beside the uh, Dewar Centre, because it seems somewhat counterintuitive to send somebody who lives right next door all the way up to the academy to vote when potentially it could be accommodated there. I have no, you know, so that I think that's just a request, I suppose, to the chief executive when she's looking at these things to take into account some of the issues that were raised before for my ward. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Executive would now like to come in. Thank you. Chief Executive. Well, while we're waiting for Chief Executive, I think there's a bit of a problem here too. Sorry, Councillor McDean. So the Chief Executive is on mute, but she's on the phone, so she'll have to dial star six to be able to talk. OK. Technology thing has not been our best today. Deputy Provost, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. My sincere apologies for the technical problems that I appear to be having this afternoon. I, I'm no longer able to access Teams meetings at all. Uh, can I take uh, Councillor McCall's point? Yes, Councillor McCall, I'm very happy to look at that. Um, essentially, the paper uh, has changed since uh, it was written and Craigie and Moncrief uh, halls are now prepared to allow the by-election to go ahead. So we don't need to look at alternative venues. Um, I would be grateful, councillors, on this occasion only, and I stress on this occasion only, that I am given permission to change venues if that is needed under emergency conditions. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. I'm sure under the circumstances, all councillors will be happy to agree to, the, agree to this. If I may comment? Yes. Thank you. I think, uh, yes, I agree with the, the emergency powers, but I think if it's possible to do so, to have consultation with the existing ward councillors who know the, the patch probably as well as anybody. Yes, of course, happy to do that. Councillor McDade. Councillor McDade. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, the Chief Executive has answered my question, which was going to be um, there is no time limit specified on this, um, but she's answered that it is just for these by elections, um, which I am content with. Um, I would just ask that that is um, recorded as part of the decision. Councillor McDade, it actually says that in the paper due to the potential impact of COVID 19 on the by election planning. Yes, this, is purely, this is purely COVID we are talking about at the moment. Thank yes, you. There may be, uh, sorry, there may be other by-elections during the COVID-19 pandemic, which might be next year, for example. Um, mm. I'm just concerned that we make this time limited and it would have to come back to a future council meeting um, should this situation arise again. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I was about to make exactly the same point as Councillor McDade that um, uh, the wording in the agenda is not clear that this is a time limited um, delegation of authority um, and that um, it should, if it's related just to these two particular by elections, that's fine. But if it went on beyond that, um, uh, then, then I would uh, like to see that just firmed up in the record of the decision. Can I ask the Chief Executive if she would like to, to come in again, please? Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost, but I've really nothing further to add. I think I've made it perfectly clear that it's for a time limited period uh, due to this specific by-election and clearly if there are other issues in future and other by-elections that require decisions to be made, they will indeed come to full council. 
certainly not in any way trying to undermine the democratic decision making of elected members. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, if we're quite happy, happy to agree, paper 12, we will now. Yep, yep, you promised I did put a. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Wilson. Yes, I did see your yep, comment. Yep. Sorry. I, I realise the difficulties of being there wearing the t shirt. Um, a, I think, and with reference to Councillor McCall's comments, um, first of all, it's not anybody's individual word, it's a word that's represented by Councillor McCall, Councillor Roderick Coates, and myself, and until recently, um, sadly, the, the late Bob Band. Um, so, uh, but uh, the, the comments about the, the voting from Riggs Road area, White Friar Street, etc., are valid because um, if, if we had gone to Dewar's, which is now not the case, um, there would have been a strong case to do something about, um, even on a temporary basis. I realise it's difficult moving around polling stations, but I think the issue should be addressed as, as soon as practicable, and it should be uh, discussed um, with, with the three elected members for the ward, and perhaps um, members from the, the adjacent Perth North ward, because they're, they're, they're pretty nearby in, in, in many regards as, as well. Um, I think it's also important for all of us, Deputy Provost, um, given the, the ongoing situation of the phasing of the pandemic, that we encourage as many people as possible, irrespective of our politics or irrespective of our views, that postal votes are available to people um, if, if they want to apply for one. And um, we should readily um, help to encourage that, that that process, given that many people will be reluctant to go out, even if the polls are open. And I would make that plea to everybody, irrespective of politics or influence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilson. I don't see or hear anyone wishing to make a comment on this item, so we're happy to agree paper 12. Okay. But now we go to the record of decisions under emergency powers. Um, you're asked to note the decisions under the emergency powers on the 10th of March 2020 and the 17th of August 2020. Are members happy to agree with that? We've got a question. So, sorry. This is noted. Are there any questions on this report? Yeah. Question from Councillor Stewart. Councillor Stewart. Um, yeah, it was a question on the um, first one. Um, I think the day that we went into emergency powers was the 16th of March. I was just wondering why that um, timeline for review of the contributions policy being revised um, was taken prior to um, that date. Gordon Patterson can answer that question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Could I ask if you could point out uh, which page of the papers you're referencing in that regard, please? Um, sorry, it's the uh, item 13 on the agenda, record of decisions under emergency powers. 10th of March 2020, the timeline for review of the, it's just on page four of the document pack. Timeline for the review of contributions policy be revised with the intention to bring forward a report to Council in April 2021 to allow a full and thorough consultation process to take place. Um, my inclination is perhaps to suggest that that date <clears throat> may not be entirely correct. I would like to look back and double check that and correspond it with the decisions that were, that were made at that point. Certainly, um, the consultation that was underway in relation to the proposed revision of the contributions policy was impacted around about that time. Um, however, I think it was slightly later when decisions were made around whether or not we would continue with the plan that we brought to Council last year. So if you would allow me to check that uh, against the minutes of the Gold Command meeting, um, I can clarify that for you and for other elected members. OK, thank you, Chief Officer. I appreciate, obviously, that um, just at that point, going out to a full uh, consultation process would have been 
um, you know, any point in, in March would have been um, difficult to do. But obviously, the review of the policy um, has been required um, by uh, decisions of the, the, the Council for quite a long time. So, um, it, but if you're happy to go back and clarify that, I'm otherwise um, happy to um, uh, for, for you to come back and clarify that so that we can note it this uh, record of decision at a future point in time. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, it, it might it might be as simple as a typo at the zero instead of a six. So I don't know. I'm just adding the simplistic answer to, to maybe the query. That, that's fine. Uh, I don't, that's, I don't that's know. Fine. Just... The Chief Officer can come back and clarify. Right. OK, then. Thank you. Any other questions on this report? OK, thank you. Thank you very much for for all your contributions to the meeting. We now um, I'm going to hand back to the province because we have now got a valedictory for Keith McNamara, the Deputy Director of Housing and Environment, who is about to leave Bethlehem and Ross Council and go off and join Teesside Contracts. So I will now hand back to the province. So thank you all very much for your patience with me today. I am very sorry that technology has let me down, but I'm assured by IT it's not my fault. It was the IT and the hardware. So thank you very much for your patience. Provost. You're on mute, Provost. A long day. Thank you very much and thank you, Deputy okay. Provost. Councillors, as you will be aware, Keith McNamara is leaving us at the end of the month to take up the post of Managing Director with Tayside Contracts. As such, I would like to say a few words about Keith's career and his enormous contribution to Perth and Cross Council. A native of Edinburgh, Keith started school at Longstone Primary in Edinburgh. The family then moved to Glasgow as his dad worked in the prison service and he went to Moody'sburn Primary and after primary he went to Christon High School in Glasgow when he became the Ducks. This was followed by six, year at four, six years at Forfar Academy where he completed his secondary education. Following Saturday jobs and in true form, there was the shoe shop and Boots the Chemist he was employed by Perth and Kinross Council for the summers between 1983 and 1987 as a student environmental health officer. This was to support his studies at Strathclyde University, where he was awarded first class honours degree in environmental health in 1987. Keith's first permanent appointment that year was as an assistant environmental health officer with Angus Council. However, the lure of the area proved too strong and Keith returned to our District Council in August 1988 and he's been part of Perth and Kinross Council ever since. He moved up the ranks of environmental health at a rapid pace before becoming Principal Officer Food Safety in 1995. This was a position that he only held for a short period as with local government reorganisation in 1996, he became the licensing and development manager for Perth and Kinross Council at that time. His then director said, Keith McNamara is exactly the type of officer we should develop as part of our succession planning. He is intelligent, hardworking, innovative, and a credit to the department and the council. He has more potential than any other young officer I have known. The director then added, I really cannot speak highly enough of Keith as a person or as a manager. Clearly, the rest of the council thought so as well, with promotions to support services manager and waste services manager before becoming the head of environmental and consumer services in May 2008. During his time in these roles, 
he's clearly demonstrated leadership and a real commitment to improving services. In his application for the post of principal officer in 1995, he outlines this by referring to the development of a modern database of premises with hazard priority ratings, ensuring the council was one of the first in Scotland to purchase digital auto tape equipment to provide a better service and to reduce, reduce costs. This innovation continued and as a waste, ma waste manager and head of service, he was instrumental in making significant improvements in how our waste was collected and increasing the recycling rate across Perth and Kinross to one of the best in Scotland. I moved to the corporate centre in 2015 as head of strategic commissioning and organisational development showed key flexibility and commitment to the council. However, his heart remained elsewhere as his appointment as Deputy Director of Housing and Environment did demonstrate it. He has remained determined, however, to continue to play a corporate role as his leadership of areas such as council preparations for Brexit and the development of the climate change strategy has shown. Throughout his career, Keith has been committed to partnership working and there are many examples of this from Tayside Waste Strategy Group and national groups looking at scientific services to most recently leading the recovery and renewal subgroup of the Tayside Local Resilience Partnership. Councillors, there are many key highlights of Keith's career within the Council, but it would be remiss of me not to mention three which put Perth and Kinross Council, Council firmly on the national and international stage. These were the many years of tea in the park, both at Ballado and Strathamon. The Ryder Cup last year's Solium Cup, all increasingly and incredibly successful events, which would have been less so without Keith's guiding hand, strategic thinking and operational delivery. Probably summed up best by his can-do approach. On a per personal level, Keith is very modest, as is reflected in his request in 1933 to his director to be allowed to apply to the chair of the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland, where Keith wrote, it is unusual for this position to be contested, so there is a strong possibility I will be offered it. We all know Keith to be hardworking, committed and dedicated, a true public servant who understands and works with yourselves as elected members with other officers across the council and beyond, and also with our communities often picking up issues at times of upset or crisis for them. Keith, you are going to be sorely missed. However, we are all delighted with your appointment to your new post. We also know that you're not going that far as Tayside Contracts is part of our local authority family. And we know that you will continue to work very closely with your old friends here in Perth and Cross. We wish you all the very best. Can I ask everyone to unmute and to join me in a virtual round of applause to Keith McNamara? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Provost, if I, if I may have a, a right to respond, if that's OK. Yeah, certainly. Uh, we could hardly say no to you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Phil. Thanks very much, Provost. Yeah, Provost, can, can some others uh, actually give some... Uh, There'll be uh, time for that. After Th thanks, thanks, Provost. Um, your, your kind words are, are really quite humbling and touching. Thanks very much. Now I will treasure them. Um, 
perhaps especially more meaningful coming from yourself because we've shared several forums, several community meetings and several meeting rooms over the years. So I'm, I'm so grateful, Provost. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a long day, um, Councillor, so I'm going to keep my comments mercifully brief. Um, after 36 years of working in such a fantastic organisation, working alongside so many dedicated and professional people, it's beginning to dawn on me what I'm going to be missing out by leaving the Council. Um, I've been so lucky um, to sit at the table with truly outstanding, inspirational and supportive leaders in our executive officer team, in a corporate management uh, group and also in our own service management team in housing and environment. And that absolutely applies equally to the pride I have working with colleagues across the organisation who do absolutely extraordinary things every day to protect and sustain our communities. And this has been exemplified by the truly awe-inspiring response of our council colleagues to COVID-19, which is something we all recognise and I know that we've been talking about today. I'd also like to thank from the bottom of my heart all elected members for your support, for your guidance and indeed your challenge over the years. I've greatly appreciated that and welcomed your, our interactions, even a challenge because the challenge is an essential part of local democracy. It ensures that important link to our communities and strengthens the service to the public. I've learned so much from you, from you all. Uh, my only consolation is to say, Provost, that although I may be moving out of the PKC house, I'm only metaphorically moving next door and hope to still be working with many of you in my future ventures with TSA contracts. There are so many things about PKC that I, could, I wish I could bottle up and take with me to Tayside Contracts. I'm taking away so many great memories and Provost, you were very kind about talking about some of them earlier on. Um, and I've had a fantastic time in the Council and I will greatly miss everyone. And thanks once again, Provost. I'm really grateful for these very, very touching words. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. I think one or two uh, councillors would like to say something. Councillor Grant, hey, Councillor Ling, you were, I think, wanting to say something. Uh, yes, Provost, I would like to say something before Keith uh, replied. Obviously, uh, that would have been uh, the normal order that everybody could praise him and then he could go back and, and uh, have a go of us who don't praise him, people like me. Um, no, um, Keith, uh, I've obviously known you now for eight years since I've been there and we've had a lot of hard discussions. Uh, and, and speaking to people in the in the public as well, Keith has got this annoying habit of when you're annoyed with Keith or what he's putting forward, he manages to talk you down and get a sensible outcome. And I think that's one of his strengths is that he doesn't get too involved. He's fantastic at doing it. He can talk down people who are shouting at me, come to shout at Keith. And by the time Keith's finished speaking to them, uh, they're quite happy. He does a wonderful job. And um, I'm going to miss you actually, Keith, uh, and uh, our conversations that we've had over the years and discussions and fallouts and, and, and then talking to, because I think you're one of the most successful officers we've had and one who takes, talks a lot of sense but doesn't take a line and sticks to it. You're, you're, he's always been willing to uh, take on board what councillors or anybody who are less informed as we are than he is. But he will look at it and come back and then tell me we were wrong. But uh, apart, apart from that, Keith, all I want to say is the best of luck. And um, we will be on your case as <laughs> usual uh, when you're at uh, Tayside Contracts and everything that goes wrong. And when we're not getting payments, uh, grit and that, we'll know who to contact. So I'll be still speaking to you in the future. But best luck. Uh, well done for getting the job. Well done for everything you've done. And I hope... Um, uh, yeah, and I know that your family are here now and I'm sure they'll back you up. And uh, I think I can speak for all councils, especially the SNP group and, and for everybody else, that we've enjoyed our time with you. Look at what you've done for Perth and Kinross and go on and keep working for Perth and Kinross even here on Tayside contracts. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to say anything? If I could promise. Uh, Councillor Barrett here. Keith, I want to wish you uh, all the very best in your new job with uh, Tayside Contracts on behalf of the uh, Scottish Liberal Democrat Group. Um, I've worked with you for uh, 17 years. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, longer. I'd uh, like to echo Councillor Lane's comments about you always being a, a, a calm head uh, on your shoulders. Uh, I didn't realise it was quite such an, an old head. If you're admitted into the Institute in 1933, then you must have um, one heck of a portrait picture in the in, in the attic is all I can say. Um, 
They do say that all the good ones uh, end up in housing. I think you just took longer to get there than, than most, but uh, please don't let that detract from uh, our best wishes. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Forbes. Forbes, may, may I say a couple of words? Councillor Forbes. Yeah, Councillor Forbes, I just asked you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be very, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I feel slightly odd about this. As Keith knows, it was me that chaired the committee at Tayside Contracts that offered Keith the job. So I have to apologise to his colleagues and, and my colleagues as elected members for removing him from Perth and Kinross. Um, he was by far and away the best candidate that we saw. And I'm delighted as the convener of Tayside Contracts at the moment anyway, to welcome you on board, Keith, and to thank you for the support and help you've given me over the last few years as convener of E&I. And uh, no doubt we'll be working as closely together as we have done in the past. So thanks again, Keith, and, and good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Angus. Thank you, Councillor Provost. Uh, there was one other there, but I've lost it. Uh, somebody right. else? Me, Provost. Councillor McDade. Councillor McDade. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Provost. Um, and yes, um, Keith, it's a big loss to see you go. Um, I felt I should uh, thank you on behalf of the Highland Action Partnership for the huge amount of work you've put in um, as our um, interim chair, which was a, a stint that you ended up ending up with uh, for longer than you planned and you did a very good job under difficult circumstances and we're very grateful um, and personally I'm very grateful for your support over the years in terms of uh, the issues we've had in wild camping up in Highland Perthshire uh, from a ward perspective and also as deputy director um, when there's been strategic issues as well um, and just thank you on behalf of the independent Scottish Labour Group uh, for all your support over the years to all of our members so uh, we wish you all the very best uh, and you will be missed but you're not going far so I know who to get hold of at TSA contracts as well. Thanks very thank much. You, thank Leo. You. Uh, Councillor Lyle would you like to say something? Yep thank you very much Provost. Um, again uh, just to share the sentiment of others I've known Keith for some time. The first time I really got to know Keith was when he escorted round, uh, me round Bolado at Tea in the Park, trying to keep a close rein on me. And um, I was uh, <coughs> going round with various other councillors open mouthed at the sites that were beholding to us. Um, I vividly remember the issues around moving to Strathallan and uh, the difficulties there, the tragedies there um, as well. I still remember well. And I think that um, at that time had a significant impact on us all. Um, I'd just like to thank you for your service, Keith. Um, you have been uh, an outstanding officer, exemplary, and um, I think your, your new position reflects that. And I would like to wish you every good luck in the future. Thanks very much, Murray. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lyle. There was a couple of uh, things came up in the chat. Councillor McCall, thanks for your help and patient explanations to your newbie over the last three and a half years. Uh, Councillor Henry Anderson, good luck, Keith. You've been a great officer to work with. I recall his licence and convenience of the challenges, the tea in the park, and I'd remember them well too. Keith, well done and congratulations, and we look forward to seeing you at Tayside Contracts. Uh, Provost, can I just come in and say I think uh, the COVID has been organised uh, uh, and the lockdown partly by um, Keith because the the thought he, that he might have to take us all, all out to the old ship or somewhere uh, and buy us a drink was was anathema to him and so he this could be the whole thing could be round to event uh, uh, prevent Keith having to buy us all a beer to celebrate his new um, position. I um, think it would be a lot of excuse. <laughs> more than happy to buy a beer any time I see you in future, Councillor, laying at an appropriate social distance, obviously. <laughs> OK, I'll be stalking outside your house from now on. Cheers, Keith. Well said. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best once again, uh, Keith. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for uh, a good major meeting. Thank you.